How are we doing now? Good? Yeah, okay. Um, I was thinking about plans uh, as the elders were praying with me this morning. You know, we were reminded of God's certainty and his intentional nature. And um, thinking about strategies and schemes, I actually... um, was looking over at the church camp where I now live on a lake. And I thought back, I was about 12 years old, up here on vacation, long before I lived up here. And two cousins and myself um, decided to attack the uh, local church camp. So we came up with a military strategy of sorts, and we... um, We slipped up to the shore of that camp about 2 a.m. with a boat loaded down with bottle rockets. And we we had some pipes. Anybody remember? You've probably all shot those, I would think, in Michigan. Yep, you just have to uh, borrow a cigarette lighter from an uncle. And and, uh, it was just in the middle of the night. It was quite a peppering of, of rocket fire on that camp. They were bouncing off screens on the cabins and landing on the roofs. And it was uh, over in about 30 seconds. And we slipped into a tunnel between the two lakes there. Uh, and you could hear them up above us on the road. And you see the beams of flashlights everywhere. But nobody thought to look in the tunnel where we were hiding in the dark. So it was a well-executed plan. Uh, never got caught. There's my confession. Uh, so, We've rescued boats and counselors and whatnot many times out of the lake since, so we've sort of um, maybe helped redeem ourselves a little bit. But from the, um, I remember from the talk of the campers, they thought it was great fun to be out running around with flashlights at 2, 3 a.m. I'm not sure the counselors and the administration would have appreciated um, the rocket fire as much as we did. But, you know, the minds of 12-year-old boys. So is that a strategy? Or is it a scheme? (laughs) And what's the difference sometimes? I was thinking about Jacob, because this is my week to speak about Jacob. Kent's sharing about Joseph in the next couple of weeks. And Jacob drew a fine line between the two, but he was always involved in some kind of strategy or, or scheme. Last week, when we talked about the house of Isaac, we saw the moral collapse there. God had, had you know, told Rebekah that the, younger son, the older son would serve the younger. Esau would serve Jacob. And when it came time when those boys were adults and it came time for the birthright and the blessing, remember, everybody was tricking each other. Mom against dad, brother against brother. And Esau was so mad he wanted to kill Jacob for stealing the blessing, although Esau sold his birthright. But Jacob caught him at his weakest moment. Um, Nobody really stopped to say, I wonder if we just let God handle this, if it'll all come out okay. James says, God does not sin, nor does he tempt anyone to sin. I always remember that when I'm thinking about these passages that show so much humanness. And uh, Isaac was old and blind and, and they tricked him. Jacob, you know, got in and goat skins and smelled like Esau and they, they had food like Esau and uh, they pulled it off. Now Jacob has had to run since we last I last taught about him, and he goes to his uncles, and his uncle's a manipulator, and he's a schemer. So his uncle pawns off a daughter onto Jacob that Jacob didn't bargain for, and he ends up with two wives. He's been with his uncle Laban now for years and years, serving him, and he schemed while he was there, and he became rich from it. But he also boosted his uncle's flocks and wealth along with it. So Uncle Laban is okay with it. And we're going to pick up today, to me, the defining moment in Jacob's life. 
Because you're going to pull off that scheming or try to with God. And God's going to call him on the carpet. God is going to literally knock him on the ground and make him account for himself. Maybe for the first time in his life. And we're going to see a very clear exchange between God and man in this passage. Genesis 32. If... uh, You would like to turn there with me. Jacob and Esau are going to meet for the first time in years now. Last time Jacob was around his brother, he wanted to kill him. And now, out in the fields of life, these brothers will meet. I they will not be get together again until their father's death. This will be the one time, really since leaving home, that they'll, they'll be together briefly. I'm not going to read all about their reunion. That's not my point today. But we're going to read chapter 32 of Genesis. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said... This is the camp to, camp of God. So he named that place Mahanaim. Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He instructed them, this is what you are to say to my Lord Esau. Notice how his attitude has changed now. Your servant Jacob says, I've been staying with Laban and have remained there till now. I have cattle, donkey, sheep, goats, male and female servants. Now I am sending this message to my Lord that I might find favor in your eyes. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said, We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you with, and 400 men are with him. Now that doesn't sound like a happy greeting party necessarily. Verse 7, in great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camel as well. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. There's another strategy from him. It's a good idea. You're not going to get all of us. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make you descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Verse 13. He spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 female camels with young, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, Ten male donkeys. He put them in care of his servants, each herd by itself, and said to his servants, Go ahead of me, keep some space between the herds. That's going to overwhelm Esau. I'm just going to hit him in waves, all the gifts and the tribute. And and in one way, he had the lion's share, not only the birthright, but the bigger blessing from his father. So obviously, that's paid off now, and he's, he's sharing some of that with his brother, which is not a bad thing to do. Verse 17, he instructed the one in the lead, when my brother Esau meets you and asks, who do you belong to, where are you going, and who owns all these animals in front of you, then you are to say, they belong to your servant Jacob, they are the gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is coming behind us. He also instructed the second, third, and all the others who followed the herds, you do the same thing. To Esau, when you meet him. 
And be sure to say, your servant Jacob is coming behind us. For he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I am sending on ahead. Bit of a scheme, isn't it? When I see him, perhaps he will receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him. But that night Jacob got up, verse 22, took his two wives, female servants, 11 sons, crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because of the socket Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. So let's start with this. A time ago, I would have put this with two other places in the Bible as the strangest stories in all of Scripture. This is one of them. I just didn't get it. What in the world does this wrestling match really have to do with anything? The other would be Jonah. A guy swallowed by a fish who said, throw me in the sea. I don't know what he was thinking, if he just knew it was the end or he didn't think God would follow him down there and it was worth it to beat God finally in the race away from him. I don't know. And then the third was, remember there was a time when a hand came out and wrote on the wall and scared everybody out of their skin that was watching. But I would have put this in that group And now that I've thought about it and I've looked at Jacob's life a few times, I think it is absolutely brilliant. It's genius. He is so competitive. What a great way to get his attention. Just to knock him in the sand and physically fight with him. I think it's perfect. It's perfect Jacob-esque stuff. And God knew Jacob's just going to fight back. I don't know how it happened, but they don't know each other's names. Obviously, the angel didn't say, I'm so-and-so, and and by the way, bring it on, buddy. He may have just showed up out of nowhere and put him in a bear hug and knocked him on the ground, for all I know. It's what it sounds like. There's just a guy there all of a sudden wrestling with him. And they wrestle all night. And I think it's a, it's a perfect way to get Jacob's attention, the more I've thought about it. I no longer find it such a strange account. But if you go back to verse 9, it's very interesting to me in the verses... 9 to 12, because Jacob, when he realizes he's between a rock and a hard place, I've got this brother with 400 men who could easily slaughter us. All of a sudden, it's, God, it's about your agenda and your plan, and I want to do what, remember that promise you gave my grandfather, and we've got to get, we, you've got to see that through, and I'm the guy, I got the blessing. And God doesn't just let him scheme and manipulate 
his way through that one. God literally has a messenger show up and knock him on the ground. And you notice when you get down to uh, verse 27 at the end of the fight, Jacob is hanging on. He won't let go. That's just Jacob. You know? I thought of, um, I thought of Spencer and Luke. I don't, there's Luke, yeah. You guys are always wrestling, right? He's, he's, he's always, what's his phrase? I'm, I'm not going to tap out. He doesn't care. He's going to hang on. You guys should appreciate this as much as anyone in the room. And Jacob hangs on and he says, you've, you've got to bless me. And what does the guy, what does the angel, the man say? What is your name? In that name, it is associated with deceit. He was the heel grabber. That's what the name means. He was the one that tripped up the original heir to, to the, the blessing and the birthright. That's all he had to say to the angel. Well, what's, what's in a name? That's my title for this morning. What's in a name? In Jacob's name, it's, it's as if he is saying to the angel, I'm Jacob the schemer. I am Jacob the shyster. And immediately, the angel blesses him and says, no more. I'm giving you a new name and it's Israel. But it's not until he comes to that grand, open, honest, I'm holding nothing back, confession to God, that God gives him the blessing and acts on Jacob's behalf. When the angel says, Verse 28, the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. He already struggled with humans in his past. He got the best of Esau. He got the best of his father. He got the best of Laban. This is a guy that can take lemons and make lemonade. He's done it repeatedly. And he's always been religious. Yeah, 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 we got that promise, but I've got an agenda. And all of a sudden, he's evoking that promise, right? Crying out with that promise to God, and God's not going to let him just scheme his way through it. You want the blessing? Are you serious about this promise? Tell me who you are. I'm a shyster. I confess who I am. And it's not the, because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. The angel said, because you struggled with God and humans and you prevailed, you overcame. That's not talking about the wrestling match. He came face to face with God at this point in his life. I need you. I am not worthy to stand before you. This was a deep confession, and Jacob knows that, and the angel knows that, and God knows it. I think when Paul talked about, remember Paul said he had this affliction of the flesh, and God ends up telling him, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I'm not going to fix this for you. I think... God and Paul both knew they were talking about things much bigger than just physical ailments. They were talking about weakness as a human being. In our weakness, all of us, no matter what it is, that's how God shines through. You take a painting and you put a dark background on it. A lot of painters do this and they put points of light and places of light And that light, that goodness of the painting just shines out. That's the same thing God wants to do through us. And I hope 
that we've all come to that place where we've totally come clean with God. Yep, I, I am not innocent before you. I have nothing to claim to have your holiness, your generosity, and your love. It's just because you are God. I get that. Because I think that's the, the point that he's, that he's come to in his life. And it's defining. It's life-changing. And if I only had one week for Jacob, and that, that was it, it's this interaction for me that sets his life on a course from here on out. So far, he could kind of keep all that in his hip pocket and, and keep building his flocks and his herds and his wife and his kids and all that's fine stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But at some point, he had to wrestle with God. You want God's blessing. You're God's child. You're God, in God's camp. At some point, you've got to wrestle with God as a human being. And he expects us to come clean. It's all through the New Testament. If you look at some time and read Romans or uh, Hebrews 12, a number of times in Scripture, God has things to say about Esau. And he does clearly in Hebrews. Don't be like Esau, he says, who just sold his birthright for the price of a meal. He just didn't care about God's promise or his father's part in that or becoming the lineage of a redeemer. Jacob... I don't think Jacob's any better person than Esau. Tim Keller once said, heaven's not going to be full of good people. It's going to be full of people who realized they got nothing without God. And this is an account, pre-Christ, of course. But to me, it's, it's very clear what's just happened in front of us in, in print. I think of Gideon. Remember Gideon? Gideon was a reluctant warrior for God. And the raiders and the enemy were raiding them and, and getting their crops, and they were very successful to the point where Gideon is hiding in the wine press where they process the grapes, threshing his wheat and his crops because he's afraid. An angel showed up there. And largely the same thing happens. Gideon says, let me go. And he runs and he butchers an animal and he, or at least cuts it up, brings back offerings, puts them on the rock there. And immediately that angel zaps that offering and burns it up. And there's the aroma to God. And boom, the angel's gone. Again, you see somebody just coming clean before God. I'm confessing before you that I'm afraid and you are God and I need your blessing. That's exactly what Gideon did. And that quick, God engaged on his behalf. These are really great accounts. Jacob's weaknesses, hey, welcome to the human race, right? We all have them. May not be like his, but I have them too. And as I've said before, personally, I probably relate to Jacob more than anybody in the Bible. Some, some ways and good ways. There are times when I knew in life I had lemons and I had to somehow figure out how to make lemonade. And I went back and read about Jacob. He encouraged me that way. Other times, yeah, I've been a bit of a schemer too and at times in my life, probably to get what I want. Worse things than firebombing a church camp with little tiny rockets. The result, ultimately, 
will be our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, in this. Ultimately, God will see us through to heal us, all of us. Not because these people were so righteous at every point in their life, but because He's so good at dealing with us, showing us love when we most need it, picking us up out of the dirt when we've been knocked there by He didn't even know who, and setting Him back on His feet on a path through life. That's a great God. You notice he asked the angel, what's your name? Boy, what a typical God answer. Why do you need my name? Remember when Moses met with God on the mountain? God said, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And Moses said, you know, if I go to Egypt, I don't even know your name. He said, isn't it enough that I am? that I exist. You don't need to put me in a box. I'm big. Just tell them that. Jesus spoke those words when they had arrested him, right? I, they said, are you Jesus the Christ? I am. Do you remember what happened? A whole bunch of people were just bowled over onto the ground. I read Revelation 19 this week. Jesus ready to return to the earth and take it by force. In the future, says he has a name written on him that nobody knows but himself. I think that's a very nice capturing in Genesis 32 of the creation that can be so easily labeled in the presence of a God who can't be who can't be put in a box. I served with Navajo Indians for 10 years. I was going to bring a hymnal today and show you, but there's no word for God in their language. Not like us. They just translate it God. It's the way it appears in the Navajo Bible, the Navajo language. It's not that they don't have a God, but He's just out there. He's not personal like our God. So they wanted to use our name for God. I can walk around with water all day long. But at some point, if I don't interact with that water and take it, let it pour into me and do something, it's just a religious act of carrying water, right? It can't be that way with God. He's just more God than that. He wants to be more God than that in our lives. And what a privilege to call ourselves the body of Christ, the people of God the children of Abraham that can carry this out even now. So I'm looking forward to Joseph next. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. We saw that today. Those he justified, he glorified. And we'll see Joseph at the top of the heap in the next couple weeks, possibly, whatever you decide to share there. Let's close in prayer. We'll stand, please, to close. Father, you are a good God, a big God. We want to label everything in life. I've got stickers at home all over the place to label. Work, notebooks, all kinds of things, but labeling you is dangerous. You are just so big. You're in everything and everywhere. Everywhere in creation, you're seen. May we always remember that as we read these accounts. 
And who we are before you is because you transform us into new creations. Give us new names. Thank you for being that God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.